Six. Two men in straw hats. When Bond left the bar, he walked purposefully along the pavement, flanking the tree-lined boulevard towards his hotel a few hundred yards away. He was hungry. The day was still beautiful, but by now the sun was very hot, and the plane trees, spaced about twenty feet apart on the grass verge between the pavement and the broad tarmac, gave a cool shade. There were few people abroad, and the two men standing quietly under a tree on the opposite side of the boulevard looked out of place. Bond noticed them when he was still a hundred yards away, and when the same distance separated them from the ornamental porte cochere of the Splendide. There was something rather disquieting about their appearance. They were both small, and they were dressed alike in dark and, Bond reflected, rather hot-looking suits. They had the appearance of a variety turn waiting for a bus on the way to the theatre. Each wore a straw hat with a thick black ribbon, as a concession, perhaps, to the holiday atmosphere of the resort, and the brims of these and the shadow from the tree under which they stood obscured their faces. Incongruously, each dark, squat little figure was illuminated by a touch of bright color. They were both carrying square camera cases slung from the shoulder, and one case was bright red, and the other case bright blue. By the time Bond had taken in these details, he had come to within fifty yards of the two men. He was reflecting on the ranges of various types of weapon and the possibilities of cover when an extraordinary and terrible scene was enacted. Red Man seemed to give a short nod to Blue Man. With a quick movement, Blue Man unslung his blue camera case. Blue Man, and Bond could not see exactly as the trunk of a plane tree beside him just then intervened to obscure his vision, bent forward and seemed to fiddle with the case. Then, with a blinding flash of white light, there was an ear-splitting crack of a monstrous explosion, and Bond, despite the protection of the tree trunk, was slammed down to the pavement by a bolt of hot air which dented his cheeks and stomach as if they had been made of paper. He lay, gazing up at the sun, while the air, or so it seemed to him, went on twanging with the explosion as if someone had hit the bass register of a piano with a sledgehammer. When, dazed and half-conscious, he raised himself on one knee, a ghastly rain of pieces of flesh and shreds of blood-soaked clothing fell on him and around him, mingled with branches and gravel, then a shower of small twigs and leaves. From all sides came the sharp tinkling of falling glass. Above in the sky hung a mushroom of black smoke which rose and dissolved as he drunkenly watched it. There was an obscene smell of high explosive, of burning wood, and of, yes, that was it, roast mutton. For fifty yards down the boulevard, the trees were leafless and charred. Opposite, two of them had snapped off near the base and lay drunkenly across the road. Between them, there was still a smoking crater. Of the two men in straw hats, there remained absolutely nothing. But there were red traces on the road and on the pavements and against the trunks of the trees, and there were glittering shreds high up in the branches. Bond felt himself starting to vomit. It was Matisse who got to him first, and by that time, Bond was standing with his arm around the tree which had saved his life. Stupefied, but unharmed, he allowed Matisse to lead him off towards the Splendide, from which guests and servants were pouring in chattering fright. As the distant clang of bells heralded the arrival of ambulances and fire engines, they managed to push through the throng and up the short stairs along the corridor to Bond's room. Matisse paused only to turn on the radio in front of the fireplace. Then, while Bond stripped off his blood-flecked clothes, Matisse sprayed him with questions. When it came to the description of the two men, Matisse tore the telephone off its hook beside Bond's bed. And tell the police, he concluded, tell them that the Englishman from Jamaica who was knocked over by the blast is my affair. He is unhurt and they are not to worry him. I will explain to them in half an hour. They should tell the press that it was apparently a vendetta between two Bulgarian communists and that one killed the other with a bomb. They need say nothing of the third Bulgar who must have been hanging about somewhere, but they must get him at all costs. He will certainly head for Paris. Roadblocks everywhere, understand? Alors, bonne chance. Matisse turned back to Bond and heard him to the end. Mare, but you were lucky, he said, when Bond had finished. Certainly the bomb was intended for you. It must have been faulty. They intended to throw it and then dodge behind their tree. But it all came out the other way around. Never mind, we will discover the facts. He paused. But certainly it is a curious affair, and these people appear to be taking you seriously. Matisse looked affronted. But how did these sacré bulgars intend to escape capture? And what was the significance of the red and blue cases? We must try to find some fragments of the red one. Matisse bit his nails and his eyes glittered. This was becoming a formidable and dramatic affair, in many aspects of which he was now involved personally. Certainly it was no longer just a matter of holding Bond's coat while he had his private battle with the chief in the casino. Matisse jumped up. Now get a drink and some lunch and a rest, he ordered Bond. For me, I must get my nose quickly into this affair before the police have muddied the trail with their big black boots. Matisse turned off the radio and waved an affectionate farewell. The door slammed and the silence settled on the room. Bond sat for a while by the window and enjoyed being alive. Later, as Bond was finishing his first straight whiskey on the rocks and was contemplating the pâté de foie gras and cold langouste which the waiter had just laid out for him, the telephone rang. This is Mademoiselle Lind. The voice was low and anxious. Are you all right? Yes, quite. I'm glad. Please take care of yourself. She rang off. Bond shook himself, then picked up his knife and selected the thickest of the pieces of hot toast. He suddenly thought, two of them are dead, and I've got one more on my side. It's a start. He dipped the knife into the glass of very hot water which stood beside the pot of Strasbourg porcelain and reminded himself to tip the waiter doubly for this particular meal.